Moi aussi, cet homme-là, il me ferait peur. Des fois, ce doit être pénible tout de même. Qu'est-ce que tu en sais, Palace? Have you ever been horny? All right, weird way to start this video. People, whether or not they like to admit it, can be into some weird fetishes. Now we live in the modern day with the advent of the internet, allowing individuals to explore their curiosity to their heart's content. However, that luxury was not available back in the 1960s. And if you're in the upper class, you better act normal, or your ass is getting ostracized. Well, that's the issue that the beautiful Sabadine finds herself in. A woman who wants to satisfy both heart and flesh. Who wants to live in two opposing worlds. Her curiosity leads her down a path of debauchery and danger. Today we look at one of my favorite Bunuel films, Belle de Jour. Belle de Jour is a 1967 film based off a 1928 novel of the same name. The title itself is a play on words of the French term Belle de Nuit, translated as Beauty of the Night, or, you know, a prostitute. I think that right there should give a good indication of where this film goes. Last time we covered Bunuel on the channel was with his directorial debut, Un Chan on the Lou. By contrast, Belle de Jour was made late into his career, a mere 13 years before his death. While still a surrealist at heart, Bunuel dabbled a bit in more commercialized work. I mean, he had to secure the bag somehow. When offered the chance to adapt Joseph Cassell's adult novel, Bunuel agreed not because he liked the book, but because he hated it. His goal was to turn something he did not like into something he did. This is another perfect blue scenario where a director thinks he can tell an author's story better. And guess what? They fucking did. Absolute king energy. Bunuel's changes weren't as drastic as Khan's, but they definitely impacted how you interpret the story. So let's get into it. The movie begins with our main character Severine and her husband Pierre riding in a fancy carriage. The conversation between them reveals they have quite a complicated relationship. She's apparently too cold, and he's too tender. Moi aussi, je voudrais que tout soit parfait. Que ta froideur disparaisse. Ne me parle plus de ça, je te prie. Mais je voulais pas te fâcher. Car tu sais, j'ai pour toi une immense tendresse. À quoi peut-elle me servir ta tendresse Que tu peux être méchante avec moi quand tu veux. It seems Pierre has had enough of her attitude and forces her out of their carriage. He has the two coachmen take her to the woods. He then ties her to a tree and has the men whip her. Eventually, he tells the men to have their way with her when suddenly. À quoi -tu, it's just a dream. It's a pretty intense way to open the film, and it won't be the last time we take a glimpse into her fantasies. This one an example of masochistic interest. Masochism being the sexual arousal of one's own humiliation or pain. These daydreams don't appear in the novel at all, and are new additions by Bunuel and co-writer Jean-Claude Carrier. Like other Bunuel films, he teeters the line of reality and fiction while also diving into the psyche of his characters. In reality, Pierre is a doctor and provides them a nice upper-class lifestyle, and Sabarine is a housewife a typical marital dynamic for the time. Here we see them planning a vacation for their first wedding anniversary. It quickly becomes clear that their real-life relationship is complicated in many of the same ways as her fantasy. When Pierre calls her cold, our immediate thought is that she might be mean, but in reality she's actually very nice to her husband. What Pierre, or Severine's own imagination is trying to say, is that she's frigid, or lacking any sexual arousal. Taking this a step further, she barely shows him any intimacy. This is best shown by her refusal to share a bed with him despite being married for a year. Pierre is respectful towards her feelings, but it's clear he's also rather annoyed. The next scene we see them already on vacation at a ski resort. The snow, another allusion to her cold demeanor. It's here where we also meet the character Henry Husson, 
played by Michel Piccoli, an actor that would frequently collaborate with Bunuel. He's the partner of one of their friends, but Savarin doesn't like him. We're given a few hints as to why. First, he seems pretty apathetic towards the church. He indulges in sexual thoughts, and even views relationships as a punishment. Et voilà. He's pretty much the opposite of how someone from high society should act. He acknowledges this and even enjoys it to some extent. He even tries hitting on Severine at one point to no avail. And by the end, Pierre Sol views him in admiration. Je l'aime bien. Il est drôle. I had to make a joke, but I think someone hitting on your wife will be the least of your concerns in this film. Hussan is arguably one of the most important characters in this story, so it's important to keep these small details about him in mind. Quickly, we're back in Paris where Severine and René talk about their friend Henriette, who apparently has been working in a brothel. Once again, the issue of class is brought up. Women like them couldn't even imagine participating in such an act. Right, Severine? Hey, what's good, yeah? Arriving home, she finds a vase of flowers, a gift from Hussan. Almost appropriate that a man like him appears after such taboo talk. In fact, she's so shaken up after the conversation, she drops it by accident. Later in the day, she even drops her perfume, causing her to question what's wrong. A quick flashback reveals a young Severine being touched inappropriately by a stranger. The issue is quite clear. The complicated relationship she has with her partner and her own sexuality stems from childhood abuse. By now, it should be clear that this film covers a lot of sexual topics, like trauma, repression, orientation, masochism, and general fetishes. Bunuel didn't really set out to make any politically charged message about sexuality with this film, but over the decades, various scholars have viewed this film as an interesting dissection of the subject. No one's ever going to accuse Bunuel of being a feminist. No one's ever going to say, ah yes, the great feminist film Belle de Jour, and yet it is a movie of great interest to feminists who study imagery and sexuality. It always has been and always will. The following scene has her discussing brothels with her husband. She begins by asking him about his experience to which he seems uninterested. After some pleading, he gives in. Of note is this quote. Tu t'enfermes une demi-heure avec elle, et quand tu sors, tu es triste pour tout le reste de la journée. Qu'est-ce que tu veux? Semaine de retenir tout venez nous mest. The Latin phrase roughly translates to "to retain one semen is poisonous." The phrase was usually used as a justification for masturbation. Here, it's to justify the indulgence of sex. Continuing on the use of Latin, it also reveals the distance between the two. The use of Latin reflects his high-class education, and the general use of a different language emphasizes the inability to communicate. As we'll see later in the film, Severine has different interests when it comes to sex, their interests that Pierre is unable to fulfill for her. This inability largely stems from acquired behavior as a member of high society. Putting it simply, he's too tender. The camera work in this scene also subtly reveals the power dynamics between the two. The camera begins on her as she asks the question, and slowly turns in his direction, pushing her to the edges of the screen. It emphasizes the entrapment she feels within the boundaries of high society life. It may also emphasize a sort of subordinate, father-daughter type relationship she feels towards him. This is further stressed as they leave the room. Tu veux que je vienne avec toi? Non, non. Oui. Je reviens que tu restes jusqu'à ce que je m'endorme. Perhaps an emphasis on how the behavior of adult Severine is intertwined with her childhood. Some time passes and things appear to be back to normal. That is, until she runs into Henriette and Hussan. I think Hussan's introduction here was really well done. We only hear his voice at first, leading us to believe that it's just in her head. Ah, la mystérieuse Henriette. La femme aux deux visages. And that's when his presence is revealed. 
It's a subtle way to show that Husan is beginning to have an influence on her. They begin to talk about brothels which he admits he hasn't much experience with. Severin on the other hand comments her disapproval. Before leaving he tells her the address of one of the brothels he used to frequent. As she walks away, Husan's voice actually plays in her head. Chez Madame Anaïs, 11 Cité Jean de Saumur. And that's exactly where she ends up going. Another interesting thing to note is Severine's wardrobe. Throughout the film she wears primarily white, a color often associated with purity. However, she's now dressed in a grey coat, emphasizing a shift towards impurity. Hussan was also dressed in pure black during their conversation, so it could also be hinting at his influence over her. In her fantasy she wore a red dress, a color often associated with love or even lust. It can also be associated with violence, both appropriate for the masochistic fantasy she appeared in. Then there is a pink dress she wears right after her childhood flashback. We can see that as a hint towards her childhood influencing her as an adult. And the dress she wore in her flashback was black, marking this memory as evil and impure. Initially she's hesitant but eventually succumbs to her curiosity. As she walks up the stairs she has a flashback to a communion where she refuses a communion wafer. The implication being that she has not confessed her abuse to the priest, and thus considers herself impure. As she goes to ring the doorbell, she reads the label modes on the door. Modes is a French term for fashion, implying the brothel disguises itself as a fashion studio of some sort. It also hints at how important the use of clothes are in this film. She's greeted by Madame Anaïs, and they start to discuss a potential job at the brothel. The topic of payment is brought up again, just like with René and Husson. Generally, the reason why someone would work at a brothel would be for the money. Typically, no one does it for the love of the game, so to speak. And that's exactly why Severine wants to leave. She doesn't want to admit why she's doing this. Eventually, she agrees to work from 2 to 5 later that day. From here, she goes to see Pierre at the hospital. Superficially, she's simply asking him to get some lunch with her. Subconsciously, it's a cry for help. Getting lunch with him would give her an excuse to not go to the brothel at 2, but Pierre has other plans. Sorry honey, I'm on that grind and I just gotta have lunch with my boss. That lunch better be delicious cause you're gonna be paying for it. A lot. This is just another example of how they may be married, but they live in two different worlds. On her way back to the brothel, we focus again on more clothing. Her shoes and her sunglasses. The shoes are another nod at her upper class status, but the sunglasses are a bit more complex. Eyes play a significant role in Bunuel's films. Arguably his most famous scene comes from Unshan Andalou and consists of an eye being sliced open. Covering eyes with sunglasses can be read in many different ways. The eye can be associated with voyeurism, the practice of gaining sexual pleasure from watching others engage in lewd acts, an event that happens later on. It could also represent bourgeoisie blindness, limiting how you see the world as part of the upper class. Venturing into the brothel will show her how the real world works. In order to protect her privacy, Madame Anaïs gives her the name Belle de Jour. At one point, Madame Anaïs offers her a kiss and she slightly leans into it, surprising even herself. Now I'm by no means the most knowledgeable person when it comes to lesbian history, but I think it's a safe bet to say that gay relationships were probably not accepted in the 60s, and even less by the influential church. If Sebedin ever considered being with a woman, well, there was no outlet for her to explore that. This may sound strange, but the brothel provides her a place of freedom from the chains of her status. We go on to meet our first client, a candy manufacturer. But as we'll see, he's anything but sweet. Once again, class division is hinted throughout the scene. Tu y es la belle femme, y a rien acheté, tous les morceaux sont bons. Ne n'y pensez plus, je vous dis, elle est bien trop convenable. The girls admire her clothes. Effet distingué, 
C'est tout ce que j'aime. <rire> Depuis le temps que vous me promettez un cadeau. J'aimerais une chose comme ça. Oh, et oh, je suis pas au de ma poule. Hélas. Everyone is generally having a good time, except for Severine. She leaves the room and Anaïs tries to encourage her back in. When that doesn't work, she commands her. Non mais dites-donc, ça va durer longtemps ces petites simagrées Où tu te crois ici Allez Madame, j'y vais. J'y vais. If that wasn't confirmation enough, during her time with a client, she rejects him when he tries to be nice, and then accepts him when he's more authoritative. We had our big hint in the opening, but now it has seeped into reality. Severine is submissive, even a masochist. This here marks the point of no return for her. She's in too deep. Kind of like this guy. Something interesting about this film is that while it is about sex, it isn't really sexual, like, at all. Most films covering a topic like this tend to over-embellish the act through close-up camera work. If anything, Belle de Jour focuses more on clothes than the naked body. However, not everyone got the message. Funny thing about this film is that it's Bunuel's most financially successful work. And that's because, you guessed it, sex sells. Now, this film wasn't really marketed as a sexual film, but the novel was well known for being dirty. So men came out in droves. Screenings were often packed. People even crossed borders to see this thing. The people at the time were going to see a, a, a film with whores. For instance, at that time it was forbidden in Spain, but in the city, in the French cities near Spain, like Perpignan and Bayonne, the film had an incredible success because Spanish people were crossing the borders to come and see the film. You gotta be down horrendous for that. While he was proud of the film he made, he was sad in knowing the audience was there for all the wrong reasons. A real suffering from success story. Severine leaves the brothel at 5, takes a shower, burns some evidence, and settles back in her upper class persona. Now we venture into another fantasy of hers. We see bulls and farmers, played by Pierre and Hussan. Coldness is mentioned once again. But more important is the mention of guilt. Est-ce qu'on donne un nom au taureau comme au chat Mais oui, la plupart de ceux-là s'appellent remords, excepté le dernier qui s'appelle expiation. They then recreate the scene from the painting The Angelus. This oil painting by Jean-François Millet is often associated with religious subtext, but Millet had no such intention. Here, Bunuel is probably going for the interpretation that it is religious, and that Sabatine's guilt and punishment stems from Christian upbringing. Once again, we see her tied up, dressed all in white. Her punishment this time is to be covered in mud. Once again, we see her enjoy it. Comment ça va, petite ordure? Alors, tu vas bien, espèce de traînée? Vieille roulure. Fumier. Allumé. Purin sim. Fais la timone. If there's one critique I could see someone having for this film, is that it's kind of weird for a man to write scenes of sexual fantasies from a woman's perspective. I mean, what could they really know about it, right? Well, that's a fair point, and one that Bunuel and Jean-Claude Carrier would agree with. In preparation for Belle de Jour, they would interview women, mainly those working at brothels, about their experience and any sexual fantasies. Their daydreams were reconstructed exactly from how they were told. All the daydreams in the film has been told to us by women. We would never dare of inventing women eroticism. It's funny that Bunuel, of all people, tried uplifting the voice of marginalized women more than most directors now. Apparently, a week passes by before Severine goes back to the brothel. She's scolded by Anaïs, but is still welcomed back. We're gonna meet a few strange characters today. First up is the gynecologist who brings with him some pretty interesting gear. In an ironic twist, it seems this guy is into masochism just like her. This puts Severine in an awkward position as she has no idea how to be dominant. She is sent away and replaced with Charlotte. Anaïs offers a look into the room, an act of voyeurism. We get to see a pretty interesting example 
of a humiliation fetish. An outsider looking in would question why anyone would be into this. Like, it just looks mean. I thought we had to stop out bullying. Well, ironically, there's quite a bit of planning and authority that goes into it. For instance, Charlotte slips up once and gets scolded for it. Communication plays a key role in its effectiveness. Ironically, after seeing this, Severine comments her disapproval, yet tries to look again. Girl, you can't judge, you're just like him. In more ways than just similar kinks. The gynecologist is not just part of her own upper class, but he also holds a similar job to her husband. She's looking into a very eerie mirror and is disgusted with herself, but just can't turn away. The next client we meet is an Asian businessman. He shows some mysterious box to one of the girls, who leaves in disgust. However, when he shows it to Severine, she doesn't back away. You might expect me to analyze the symbolism of what's in the mysterious box, but to be honest, nobody knows. It's one of Bunuel's famous mysteries. Slap that shit on a Bunuel iceberg or something. The maid finds Severine lying on the bed and some blood on a towel. Then this dialogue is exchanged. Moi aussi, cet homme-là, il me ferait peur. Des fois, ce doit être pénible tout de même. Qu'est-ce que tu en sais, Palace? She sunk further into it. Let's take a minute to talk not about Severine, but about actress Catherine Deneuve, who mimics her character in a few ways. The studio behind Belle de Jour wanted it to have more commercial appeal than Bunuel's previous work. So, at their request, they had Deneuve star in the lead role. And Bunuel wasn't exactly thrilled. Up till this point, Deneu had starred in rather simple romance films like The Umbrellas of Cherbourg. So she could look pretty, she could sing, but could she play a cold, complex character? Well, she wasn't bad, but there are definitely scenes where she looks… wooden. It's been said that these two butted heads frequently on set. I imagine it looked kind of like the gynecologist scene. She had essentially stepped into a world unknown to her, and it was an uncomfortable experience. Uh, oui, pour certaines scènes, parce que je suis assez, assez renfermée. De toute façon, c'est déjà pas une qualité à avoir pour une comédienne. Et il y avait des scènes qui m'ont gênée, des scènes qui étaient difficiles, dans la maison de rendez-vous, des choses, à, certaines scènes un peu pas vulgaires, mais enfin difficiles. However, Deneu soon grew to understand Bunuel as a director. She would go on to star in Bunuel's adaptation of Tristana, this time on her own accord. Decades later, she would look back on Belle de Jour with fondness. I was very surprised, I was very pleased, because it's really, I think, a very, a very important film and a very, uh, very special film also for me. I mean, Belle de Jour is over 25 years now, but even today, when I meet people from the press, especially in America, yes. uh, Belle de Jour is always mentioned, you know, the part of Severin, the girl I'm playing in the film, it's still today very attached to, to me, and, uh, and I think it's quite interesting. Catherine Deneu could have quit at any point, and no one could really blame her for doing so. I mean, the film covers so many taboo subjects. But she stuck with it, gave it her all, and I think that's commendable. Absolute queen energy. Our next client might be the weirdest of them all. For one, we're not even sure if this takes place in reality or fantasy. There are subtle pieces of dialogue that lean towards fantasy. Et vous venez souvent dans cet endroit? En pensée tous les jours. His kink involves a religious ceremony, and the Duke's coachmen are the very same ones from the opening. The Duke has her act as a corpse during a funeral recreation. Not just any corpse though, it's his dead daughter. And then he does this. We're not shown what he does, we're not told why he does this, and then Sabadeen is just kicked out into the rain. An interesting thing I noticed while finishing this video was the reference to cats. Monsieur le Duc, je fais entrer les chats. Allez au diable avec vos chats! This is important because the only other time it happens is during the opening. And for what it could symbolize, I got nothing. 
I mean, cats are often associated with fantastical elements like unluckiness, but why specifically this line? I'm not quite sure. It's another one of those Bunuel mysteries that doesn't have a concrete answer. Put that on the iceberg too. After having met all of our strange clients, it seems Severine is in a good mood. She even sleeps in the same bed as her husband. A lot of ironic dialogue here. Mais j'ai toujours l'impression de, de t'imposer quelque chose. Ah oh man, buddy, you don't even know the half of it. Don't get too comfortable, Severine, because Hussan is here to rain on your parade. He's come to visit her, but she feigns not being there. However, a fantasy between her and Hussan plays out. Whether it be reality or fantasy, Pierre gets cucked every single time. Qu'est-ce qu'ils font? Now we get to meet two new characters, the gangsters Hippolyte and Marcel. Out of the two, Marcel is the most important. When the girls come to meet them, Marcel shows quite an interest in Severine. Once again, clothes reveal the dynamic between characters. Severine's elegant shoes contrast Marcel's rugged boots. One belongs to a life of luxury, and the other to poverty. There's an interesting scene between Hippolyte and the other girls. One of the girls picks up his newspaper and reads the headline. Aberfan Inquiry Accused. Assez. This refers to the Aberfan disaster, which was a mining accident over in Wales during October of 1966. The disaster claimed the lives of over a hundred people most of who were children. The inclusion here is supposed to be a jab at the upper class and their first world problems. While Severine is trying to hide her double life from those around her, there are real world disasters going on and they are simply brushed aside. Admittedly, it comes out of left field, but that's Bunuel for you. Out of all the clients, it's Marcel she gets along the best with. She hopes to see him again, but runs into an issue. Pierre has taken them on a vacation. Their happy relationship seems to have only lasted for a short time. He seems to have realized that something is going on. Severine tells him that's not the case, and for the first time, we see her question her actions. Je ne sais pas comment t'expliquer. Il y a tant de choses que je voudrais moi-même comprendre, mon chéri. Des choses qui me concernent. The elements of the background help emphasize the emotions of the characters. The scene looks so grey and dead, just like their marriage, and the distance between them is even more evident. We then see Marcel and Hippolyte discuss some gang activity. Honestly, this scene has no real impact on the plot, so we're gonna brush over it. Marcel decides to call the brothel again to check if Severine has returned. Upon meeting her again, he's angry she disappeared. He's about to hit her with a belt when she does something out of character. And that's reject humiliation. Si tu recommences, je m'en vais. Et tu ne me reverras plus. One could say this is her starting to step away from her kink, but I think she's stepping further into it, taking control, just like the gynecologist. While her fantasy involves force, she's never actually forced into sex. In every instance, she's allowed herself to do this stuff, even if no one realizes. When Marcel tries to take control, she stops him. It's a pretty interesting layer to the character. She both is and isn't submissive. She likes having and not having control. If that sounds confusing to you, well, it also does to her. Once again, Severine seems to be at her happiest until something bursts her bubble. Pierre asks her for a child, which is not something she seems to want. On their walk back home, Pierre looks at a wheelchair, which will be important at the end of the film. The next client arrives, one who hasn't been here in a while. The three girls enter to meet him, and it turns out to be the devil himself, Henry Husson. There's a reason why I, and the film itself, call Husson the devil. That's because his main function in the film has been to promote temptation. He's the one who gave Severine the address, and most likely to Henriette too. He wants to seduce women as a form of punishment, a punishment for the sin of lust. It may seem hypocritical of him, but he doesn't care. His own lust for Severine stems from her perceived purity and her status as a married woman. She was someone he could not have, his own forbidden fruit. However, seeing who she really is, 
he loses interest. Mais j'ai des amis qui seraient enchantés de vous savoir ici. Je peux vous envoyer du monde. Pardonnez-moi cette défaillance. Ça me dit rien, vraiment. Dude just said she belongs to the streets. In an act of strange benevolence, he promises to not tell Pierre, but still taunts her before he leaves. C'est pas pour vous, mais vous achèterez des chocolats à Pierre de ma part. Au revoir. We enter yet another fantasy of hers, this one more brutal than the others. It's a duel to the death, on one side Hussan, the other Pierre. They line up, take their shot, but the target is Severine. Shot in the head but not quite dead, Pierre begins to kiss her quote-unquote corpse. We don't need the fantasy to tell us that she's feeling guilty. Looks like the jig is up. She informs Anaïs that she's leaving for good. She lies, saying that the reason is Marcel. Once again, the two share a conversation, insinuating something more than friendship. On s'entendait bien toutes les deux. Oui, c'est vrai. Donnez-moi de vos nouvelles, si vous pouvez, un petit coup de fil de temps en temps. Ça me ferait plaisir. Vous n'avez pas une adresse discrète? Non. Despite rejecting her, she still leans in for a kiss. But now she's the one who's rejected. As she leaves the brothel, Hippolyte follows her close behind. She tries to chill at home, but Marcel comes in. It's her worst nightmare. Her secret is bleeding into her real life. She begs Marcel to leave before her husband arrives. He agrees, but has ulterior motives. He forces Hippolyte to give up the car, permanently ending their friendship. He then guns down Pierre and makes a getaway. The cops make chase, corner him, and gun him down. Marcel ends up dying while Pierre is left in a coma. Before we reach the final scene of the film, we are treated to this weird transition. The forest of her fantasy imposed over the building she lives in. Fantasy merging with reality. Oh boy, is this gonna get confusing. As a result of the shot, Pierre is wheelchair bound and Severine looks after him. Perhaps the worst is over. Nah, screw that noise. Hussan is here to fuck shit up again. This girl literally cannot catch a break. As expected, he goes back on his promise and decides to tell Pierre about her secret life. He feels that Pierre suffers believing he is a burden to his poor innocent wife. So he deserves to know that his wife isn't the saint he thinks she is. I don't know man, if you drop this shit on me, just fucking end me right then and there. This presents a pretty interesting issue at least in my opinion. Hussan believes he's a better person than her because, well, you saw what happened. But the film paints her in a sympathetic light. She's the victim of trauma, suppression, confusion. So it's no surprise that she overindulges in her one outlet. What she does definitely is not right, but could she also be seen as a victim of her situation? Of Hussan's deliberate influence? Between these two, who's the worst? The person who pushed her down that path? or the person who went down it. For some, the answer might be clear, for others not. It's just something I'm curious about. So, Hussan goes to shatter Pierre's world, and Severine is left to wait in the hallway. The film grinds to a halt as we watch her walk around the room and wait. We feel her growing anxiety. Finally, the wait is over. Hussan leaves and Severine enters. Tears fall down Pierre's face, and it seems like he's dead. However, as she looks up again, Pierre is fine, as if nothing happened. Severine looks out her window, and instead of seeing the busy streets of Paris, she sees a forest and a carriage, the same one from the beginning. So Zelcher, what does this all mean? Well, beats me. If you're familiar with Bunuel's work, you'll know that his endings are the most incomprehensible parts of his films. Everything else might have a concrete answer, but this is something else. Bunuel has often stated that this ending really has no meaning behind it, but he says that about all his films, despite most of them being super political. So I'm taking his word with a grain of salt. I'm going to take a jab at understanding what this might mean, but keep in mind it's my perspective. A reoccurring idea within the film is the intertwining worlds. You've got high class and low class, childhood and adulthood, gangsters and brothels, churches and kinks, so naturally, the worlds of reality and fantasy had to connect at some point. We are presented two different endings, one sad, one happy. 
With this being a work of fiction, I think it's up to us to decide which one she gets to live in. If you think she should be punished, then you would go for the sad ending, with her actions effectively killing her husband. If you're more gracious, then perhaps you'd go for the happy ending, being able to live in blissful ignorance. It may not be the most satisfying conclusion for some, but I think it's fascinating. And that was Belle de Jour, a particularly bold film for 1967. It was also one of Bunuel's more conventionally structured films, having a linear plotline and all. Despite its surrealist elements, many of Bunuel's fans felt it was too great a departure from his work and that he would become more commercialized. And sure, he became more recognizable in the coming years, but his films never strayed away from his surrealist roots. And I can't wait to cover more of them in the future. Hey everybody, Zelcher here. Hope you enjoyed that video. For being such a Bunuel fan, I've only ever covered like one film by him, so I had to fix that. Like I said, this one is more conventionally structured, making the analyzing process a bit easier. Although not too easy, because it still took me quite a while. Anywho, shout out to my patrons who encourage me to make the stuff I do, and a big shout out to Little Shy Fry, as usual. Hope to see you all in the next video.